Good to see you this morning. Good to see a good friend, Tim Norman, here this morning. Good to see you. You behaving yourself there on the front row by Tim Thomas? <laughs> trying. Trying, all right. Good to see you. Um, you looked at me like, I don't know who you are, so you kind of startled me there for a moment. Do you know, in the midst of this world that we're living in, with all the chaos and confusion that we're all already dealing with, there are still families dealing with the pains that deal through our life on a regular basis. We have two families in the church that suffered uh, loss, passing of a loved one this week, and we just need to remember our families and one another in prayer. Because when you pile that load on top of the load, it becomes that much more grievous to bear. So let's remember one another in prayer. And uh, get involved in each other's lives. You can still do that. We've got the opportunity to touch people, to talk to people, uh, to touch them digitally and uh, interact with people's lives. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to continue this journey um, through the book of Nehemiah as we're talking about what God is doing in our, in our world here at Berean and what he does biblically and the model that we should follow. What we understood from the life of Nehemiah in chapter 1 is that God wants to bring revival to the people of God. How many of you believe that? I said God wants to bring revival to the people of God. How many believe that? But that process of revival is more than restoring worship or rebuilding the temple and restoring worship and rescuing God's people, that that work of revival needs to also redeem the city. And so until what God does in the church reaches the city, the work of God in revival isn't complete. How many are hearing me this morning? It's got to get out into the city. And it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with COVID. It doesn't matter if we're dealing with riding in the streets. It doesn't matter what issues we're dealing with. Our call is the same. And that's to reach this world for Jesus Christ. If there ever was a time that our world needed to hear about Jesus, it's today. Hello? It's today. And we need to be that voice. In chapter 1, Nehemiah praised in this kind of... Um, uh, uh, nebulous kind of way, God give us success. He doesn't say who he wants success with or what he wants success for, but it's implied in the text when he talks about his role with the king, and he simply says, Lord, I need success. Chapter 2 gives us the human side of that when he prays, Lord, we need favor. How many of you know that sometimes your success depends on someone else? granting you favor. Now, God doesn't always grant favor just because you ask it, but I'm going to tell you in the world we're living right now, I'd rather, <clears throat> I'd rather live in Des Moines, Iowa than in Southern California. God has given the church favor in Iowa. And we need to not take that for granted. We need to not take that lightly. We need to pray for our governor and those that are in authority so that we can continue to fulfill God's calling. I read about a church that has been fined. Last I saw was over $50,000 in fines because they refused to quit meeting. That's not being granted favor. And in your life on the job, sometimes for you to move forward, for you to experience success, for you to have the opportunities you want to have, it depends on God granting favor in your life with someone else. And I'm just telling you, it's not wrong to pray that because God can do that. And if he says no, then he has another plan. Yes. Yes. Talk to a friend. I can't go into any details right now as much as I'd like to, that uh, working in a a parachurch organization, and they've decided to not grant him favor. Do you know what that tells me? If you don't have favor with men, you can still have favor with God, and he still has a plan for you. Amen. But there are times that we need to seriously pray that God will grant us favor. And part of what we're doing and some of the rules that we're following, just to make it abundantly clear, is not because I believe that we need to do everything we're asked to do, but I want to be seen as a cooperative part of the community so that God can give us favor so that we can impact the city for the cause of Christ. Sometimes we need God to give us favor. <laughs> Amen. Some of you need to gain favor with your spouse. And... <laughs> And you're going to have to do more than pray about it. 
Hello? There are a lot of places where we need God to grant us favor. So Nehemiah prays in chapter 1, God give us success. And in chapter 2, God give me favor. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 5 says this, I answer the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, it's the same time that he's praying and speaking, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. He's asking for favor. So let's look at what that means. The first um, nine verses demonstrate to us that God has the ability to grant favor for you in the eyes of others who in, are in authority. And I think sometimes we need to take that seriously. If, if <laughs> I don't know what's happening to me right now, but I just am seeing these pictures. If you don't have favor with anybody, you don't have favor with God. Now, I know it's dangerous when all men speak well of you. But if you have to have an enemy to get up in the morning, you have to have a mutual enemy to get along with anyone. Is anyone hearing what I'm saying? That that's not the favor of God. It's not divine conviction. It's not the, the clearness of the message. It's just because you've got an issue. Somewhere in your life you need to have favor, and God can grant that with those that are over you. Proverbs 21.1 says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. That doesn't mean everything the king does that God dictates. It does mean that when God wants to work through those in authority, whether secular or sacred, he has the ability to do that. And sometimes the best laid plans of man require human intervention. So I want you to see what happens in these first nine verses. I think it's pretty, pretty interesting to watch. Nehemiah needs favor if he's going to have success in going to Jerusalem. Between chapter 1, when Nehemiah expresses his burden, and chapter 2, when Nehemiah is um, called into account by the king for his sadness, three months have passed. Why? Why is there a three-month gap between the moment that Nehemiah says, my heart is broken for the brokenness of my people, and the moment when he speaks to the king. Don't really know why it took three months. I will tell you that Persian subjects were expected to be perfectly happy in the presence of the king. So for Nehemiah to look sad was a big deal. It was a dangerous deal. It was a moment that could cost him, if not his position, his life. And especially for his closest advisor, it tells us that when Nehemiah expresses or looks sad and the king calls him out, Nehemiah's response was to be very afraid. So that three-month gap may have been that Nehemiah was just unsure how to progress, where to move forward, because there'd be a cost involved in expressing the burden of his heart. Three months after Nehemiah asked the questions about Jerusalem, he's in the presence of the king. He says, I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, there's another piece I want you to see here that's, I, I don't know what you think, but I don't think the details of Scripture are insignificant. I think when there's a detail that seems to be insignificant to us, but it's included by the Holy Spirit, it's probably there for a pr purpose. Yeah, amen. <laughs> are you ready? How many are still with me? Three months goes by, he hides his sadness. The moment that he shows his sadness, verse 6, the king with the queen sitting beside him. So what? Well, it was uncommon for the queen to sit beside the king when a guest is being entertained or is coming into the presence of the king. Now, they would share meals and share time together, but this is a little bit of an unusual moment. So think with me that while he waits for three months, the day that he responds is the day that Scripture tells us that the queen is sitting behind the king. God's timing is always perfect. And if you get in a hurry, you may precede the moment that God wants to work. Sometimes you need to settle in and wait. 
I don't know how you are, but I hate to wait. How many of you go in and check how long the waiting list is in the restaurant? And I think it'd be interesting. How many of you are willing to wait 20 minutes? Hold your hand up. How many of you are willing to wait 30 minutes? How many are waiting, willing to wait 40 minutes? Wow. Uh, how many are willing to wait an hour? Unbelievable. Um, how many are willing to wait an hour and a half? How many of you camp out? This took longer than I thought, but the point is, we all have a limit, don't we? We have a limit. Uh, my limit is about 20 minutes. It better be a free meal and the best thing I've ever tasted in my life if I'm waiting longer than that, because there's somewhere else I can get in more quickly. Whatever it is, waiting can be a challenge for us in this age that we live in instant access. Now watch this. Here's what I believe. There are moments that you will experience an emotional reaction that you weren't expecting. And when you experience an emotional reaction that you're not expecting, pay attention to what God might be doing in that moment. For three months, he can control his emotions. Most people, the longer they go, the easier it is to carry their emotions. But in that moment, this is what I believe. It's my message so I can preach it the way I want. This is what I believe that in that moment, the Spirit of God began to play with sorrow on the heart of Nehemiah because it was the moment that God had ordained for Nehemiah to speak. And in that moment, all of a sudden, the load surprised him because he was afraid at his own reaction. He was afraid at how the king would respond. He's tried hard to guard against that emotion. But there are moments where the Spirit of God will land on you and land on your emotions. And you need to not be afraid if the Spirit of God moves on you with tears, not to manipulate that. But if he moves on you with an emotion and you're walking in the Spirit of God, to let the Spirit of God play your emotions like an instrument for his purpose and use. Is that making any sense to you? He's walking along and all of a sudden this load just kind of knocks him down. Why? Because God's got a plan for that day. In those moments when that load gets really heavy, don't ignore that. Don't push it aside. God speaks in a myriad of ways, sometimes by speaking to you by impressions on your heart. But I've discovered there are moments where there may be a sense of fear that I'm experiencing or of caution that's unusual that I'm not expecting. I need to pay attention. There may be moments of joy. God's going to do a miracle. There may be moments of sorrow. God's going to intercede and do something supernatural. Pay attention to those moments and don't stoically hide them and ignore them and refuse to respond to them because he made you an emotional being. Now, forgive me for this, but sometimes... You ought to let a little emotion show in church. We are known as Pentecostals, the crazy ones that roll on the floor. Yes, I've seen that. I've seen people run. I've seen all kinds of things happen. But we moved into a generation that almost is afraid to let our emotions show in church. And there are times that you ought not have to be hyped up or pumped up or cajoled or called that there's something that happens on the inside of us that we should respond to emotionally because you're an emotional creation. Don't be afraid of that. God might be doing something. Now, God's not dependent on your emotions either. So if, brother, you want me to pray for you, it doesn't matter whether I feel anything or not. What matters is are we talking to a God who will respond? But I will tell you, Pastor Tim, you know what I'm talking about. There have been times I've laid hands on someone to pray for them. And without knowing any of the story or what was going on, something inside of me broke and tears went running down my face. There are those moments that you need to be responsive to what God's doing in that instant. The emotions struck him. And when? <laughs> this is the good part. When the queen is sitting by the king. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. <laughs> women, how many of you know, married women, how many of you know, how many of you would testify to, how many of you believe that you 
are the civilizing influence in your husband's life. <laughs> Shout now, somebody. Somebody help me right now. Don't leave me up here to die because I'll deny I said this if you don't come with me. I mean, look at a bachelor pad. In Bible college, I don't know how some guys came out of their rooms looking human when you looked at what the mess was in their room. And, and the first thing that happens is you start to pick up your clothes. You start to put dishes in the sink. And if you don't, you better start. Your marriage will last longer. There's a civilizing. Men sometimes are more magnanimous, more friendly, wanting to demonstrate what a big man they are in the moment when the, when, the, when, the, when the female is sitting by their side. I thought about four things that I can't say anymore, but sitting by the side. I can't prove that, but I'm telling you, God ordained that an emotional wave would hit Nehemiah at the same time that the queen is sitting beside the king. Oh, yeah. And the king responds with favor. Here's what I want you to see this morning. You're not in charge of the world, but he is. And there are moments that forces will come together at a perfect uh, moment that God will use for his glory, and you need to be ready for that moment. When those forces all came together, and he's asking for favor, the load of ministry hits his heart. He's sad, and he can't fake it. The, ki- the queen is sitting by the king, and when Nehemiah says, this is why I'm sad, and this is what I need, which could have gotten him killed instead, got him granted favor. Isn't that a great God? All the time that you don't think he's working, he is. When you don't see him, he's working. When you don't feel him, he's working. God is arranging I don't want to be I don't want to be too flamboyant in this but honestly arranging sometimes the universe for things to align for your purposes and the plan that he has for you. God can grant favor. And some of you need favor with family members. Some of you need favor on the job. Some need favor with your neighbors. Some need favor in other ways. God can grant that to you. Any of you have grumpy, mean neighbors? One, two, yea, three. Do I hear four? Verily five. It's amazing what he can do. We had a neighbor when we were living in Ames that was right beside us. I just prayed God would at least make her move. (laughs) Come on, do you know what I'm telling you? You're looking at me like I'm uh, speaking a foreign language. You know, like you're not getting that. How many many have ever prayed that way? God, save them or move them? (laughs) One or the other. And one day I was out working in the yard, and I had a socket set, a nice Craftsman socket set, and I'd sat it on the air conditioner unit open, and I'd forgotten about it, and it had rained. And the neighbor lady who had been giving me grief as long as she'd lived there. I mean, I mowed my grass. There's no fence. I was probably six inches over the line, and I thought I was doing her a favor, and she let me have it because my yard was ugly, and she didn't want the wheels of my mower touching her pretty grass. (laughs) Dear God, save her or move her. (laughs) But in that moment, she came over in a superior role and telling me that I left my tools outside, which allowed us to have the first positive conversation we had ever had. God can grant you favor with people in unusual ways. And the people of God need to be looking for favor. Now, if everyone's giving you favor, you're a compromiser. But if no one's giving you favor, you're a critical spirit. God will open doors for you to have favor. It says here that in verse um, 4, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. You can do two things at once. And this is an example of scripture 
of what I call bullet prayers or arrow prayers or javelin prayers, that there are times that you need to pray long and hard and in your closet prayer, but God will hear those arrow or bullet prayers that you send up. At just at the time that he has to speak, he sends up a prayer and God hears him. Do you know who can do that? People that pray without ceasing, people that live in a life of prayer. You need to shut the door of your closet and pray, but you also need to have times that you're walking and talking with him in the cool of the day, in the cool of the morning, as you're driving down the road, interacting with him. And it's a unique juxtaposition there where he says, here I prayed and I spoke. Those are wonderfully powerful moments. God will hear you in your moment of need. So I just feel like God laid this piece on my heart for this morning. Who do you need favor with? I'm not going to give an altar call here, but heads up and eyes open. I may do this three times. How many there's someone in your life that for you to do what God's called you to do, you need them to grant you favor? There's someone, let me see your hand. There's someone, hold them up, hold them up. I need God to grant favor. Okay, I'm speaking to you right now. I need you to hear me. God can grant favor in each of those circumstances if you will trust him, wait on him, and be able to respond, he will create a moment that will grant you favor, and you need to believe that and claim that and walk in that and hold that up before God. He will grant you favor. This is a morning of favor that God wants to pour on you. Now, second, Satan will raise opposition. He will always raise opposition. Do you know that while God has granted his favor in, I believe, the church has been granted favor in Iowa at a certain level, there are those who would like to see the church put to a halt, that hate the church, that hate who you are, that hate what you are, that hate everything about you. And at the same time that God grants favor, the devil is going to raise up opposition. They're going to walk side by side. And you need to be prepared for that There are those who are just looking at the church to blame the church for anything negative happening in our world right now. Sanballat and Tobiah, the Bible says in verse 10 and then 19 and 20, Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite heard about this and they were very much disturbed. What? What are they disturbed about? that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. (laughs) Oh, I just feel like I'm wandering up here, but it's all right. It's a moment in time. Anyone in the political realm that grants favor to the church, anyone in the political realm that gives favor to the church is going to be attacked by the demonic forces that hold political office. I need you to hear me right now. This is not time for the church to sleep. Listen to me. It is not time for the church to vote personalities. It's time for the church to vote policies. And you need to look at those who would love to rise to power, who have set their sights on destroying the church. Those, I'm not paranoid and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just telling you that there are people who would love to be in power whose number one purpose would be to shut the church down. There will always be those who are distressed over the welfare and the well-being of the Israelites in the New Testament, the church, God's people. They will always rise up. The Bible says this, they were much disturbed. In the King James, it says it grieved them exceedingly. Another one says displeased them greatly. They were very angry. It was evil to them, a great evil, that a man had come to seek the good of the sons of Israel. Now, why are they so upset? Because this goes back to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel rejected the assistance of the Samaritans. Do you remember that? When the Samaritans came along at the beginning of Ezra and offered to help, 
Ezra knew that they were plotting against Israel, and he said to them, you will have no part in this matter. That line was held by Ezra, and now is being held by Nehemiah, and probably Sanballat or Tobiah, maybe both of them, received the letters that the king had sent out to not hinder them, and it was salt in their wound. It was another disrespect in their face that, again, the Israelites were winning, and you're not telling us we can't have a voice. Does it sound familiar at all today? There's a liberal theological voice that wants to be heard in the church. And when we say you're not having voice here, what, what are you talking about? I, I'm just telling you, there are moral issues today that are being accepted by the populace that cannot be accepted by the church. And we have to hold that line and say, this isn't a place where that's going to be okay. Regardless of where you live and what you think and what the culture says and what is politically correct, it can't be okay here. And when the word comes out to not hinder Sanballat and Tobiah, who have been of the lineage of those that were rejected way back under Zerubbabel are still angry. The capital cities are close to each other. They don't want to see this happen, and they've set themselves to make sure that the welfare of Israel is brought to an end. I'm sorry, I'm trying to not digress. But if you're going to find a church... $10,000 a week every time they meet, you better find every restaurant and every department store that violates the same social distancing guidelines. And that is not happening. That is not happening. There are those that that are arrayed against the church. In verses 19 and 20, they mock, ridicule, and accuse. And Nehemiah reinforces the line that Zerubbabel had drawn. And let me remind you of the line that was given to encourage Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And Zerubbabel said, we don't need your help. And Nehemiah is saying, in a sense, we didn't need it then. We don't need it now. We haven't changed. We're holding the same line. It's the godly that will serve him and pursue him and follow him. And he's holding on to that principle that irritates the powers of hell. Satan hates the church. You know that, right? The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Um, Looting and robbery and violence and throwing things at police officers and somehow say that because of the sins of the past, that's okay, or because of the failure of one, we can attack the whole. What is that? It is a spirit of lawlessness in our world. It is the spirit of Antichrist in our world, and we can't afford to stand by and not be a voice for truth and for righteousness and for godliness and for law and for justice. Satan hates the church. He hates everyone and everything that God touches. So I'm saying to you, church, be ready in the days that are ahead. Don't be, don't be a snowflake or a cupcake. These are the beginnings of days that are going to intensify against the church, and we've got to be ready that while God grants favor at a, at the, at a similar trajectory, the devil is going to raise opposition, and we need to be ready for that. How? Mocking at this point. It's just mocking and ridicule and anger. We have to defend separation from compromise. While we may need favor from man, we cannot afford to compromise our faith in order to gain that favor. We have to hold our ground. Truth must be defended. And truth will prevail. Don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm not defending any of the wrong actions of officers of the law. I think they should be punished to the full extent of the law. But you have no right judging me based on what another minister has done. 
that's groupthink, that's a um, prejudicial position that we have worked hard as a nation to try to move out of the way. Let's condemn evil where it is. Let's condemn it where it is, but let's condemn it everywhere it is. And let's be a light in this generation. Truth will ultimately prevail. Well, so how's Nehemiah going to handle this? He's asking for favor and God gives it. He gets on the job and opposition rises. I want you to watch how Nehemiah handles this tension between the favor of God and the opposition of the world. Have any of you ever felt yourself in a similar spot? I've got the blessing of God, but I'm being attacked by the powers of the enemy. Anybody ever felt, what do you do? So Nehemiah arrives on the scene and this makes me chuckle. I, see, here's what I think about Nehemiah. I don't think Nehemiah was a Peter or a Paul and this force. I think he was a planner and a thinker and a prayer because God uses all kinds of people for his kingdom purposes. So it tells us, I went to Jerusalem after staying there three days resting. I set out in the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. That just makes me laugh. I'm going to ride the horse. The rest of you are going to walk. Because he doesn't want there to be a scene. He doesn't march in like a crusader proclaiming the deliverance of the Lord. He quietly begins to do what we talked about last week, to investigate the needs of the city. Without making noise, without making threats, without making promises, he just begins to investigate. One horse, people walking quietly through the city. I went out through the valley of, um, the valley gate toward the uh, jackal well, the dung gate, examining the walls which had broken down. I moved on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, and there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and reentered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. I'm telling you what, that's a powerful, powerful phrase there. I haven't told anybody anything yet, but I know who's going to do the work. <laughs> I can look out at a group of people and determine in short order Who's going to do the work? Who's going to do the work? He doesn't come in confessing victory. He doesn't come in shouting his plans. And you can proclaim the victory too soon. You can proclaim the win before it's ready to be revealed. And sometimes when God lets you see what he's going to do, you need to keep your mouth shut. Sometimes the revelation of his glory needs to be held by you until the moment again that he's ready to release that. He's holding it in. So then he meets with the people. He says to them, you see the trouble we're in. <laughs> Don't you hate it when somebody shows up new and they point out what you should have seen all along? These people were living there. Do you think they didn't know? But sometimes it helps to have someone new come into your life with new eyes and a new vision and to say, uh, I notice you're doing this or I notice this is happening. Have you thought there might be another way? Sometimes we can look at a, how many of you had a mark on your wall that you intended to fix or a hole that you're going to take care of and after time you got so used to it you didn't see it anymore? Right? And then a guest comes in and says, 
what happened here? Probably wouldn't say, why haven't you fixed it? But what happened here? And Nehemiah arrives on the scene and says, look around you. Look around you. Look at the mess we're in. He's basically gently chiding them because they've been, they've been comfortable living in a broken condition. I'm just going to tell you, I'm not comfortable living any longer in a lukewarm, compromising church. You need to look around and see where we have lost some ground, where some of the walls have broken down, where some of the gates have been burned with fire. You'll never accomplish anything great for God without an evaluation of what has been broken and what needs to change. And we're living in a time where we've been forced to step back from the way we were doing things and the way it happened to reevaluate that. And the shaking out that's happening is showing us what's essential and what isn't. And there needs to be a, there needs to be a reawakening. And I'm just, I'm going to tell you that some people who call themselves Christ followers aren't going to survive spiritually the culture and environment that we're in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They're just not. So all of us need to look around in this time and say, what have I let go? What have I let slide? What am I no longer doing that I need to be doing? Where have I let down? And where do I need to rise back up? And then he says, I also told them, <laughs> we will no longer be in disgrace. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. So what he does is he rehearses what's wrong. And then he begins to tell them what God has put on his heart. He says, let us rebuild the wall and we will no longer be in disgrace. And then he told them about the gracious hand of God on me and what the king had done. When it comes time to win the victory, you will have some evidence following you that testifies to the direction that God is leading. There'll be evidence of God's favor. And he begins to recite for them the day that came when he heard the story of the broken down walls in Jerusalem. And while the temple has been rebuilt and while people are worshiping, nobody's doing anything about the walls. The city lies in ruins. They're, they're in a mess. There's no protection from the outside. And he tells them how that it broke his heart and, and how a day came when he was troubled in the face of the king. He's telling his testimony and that how there was a moment where he just had to share what he needed to do and how the king rose to the challenge and gave him money and resources and protection and said, go do it. So he said, we're broken. Here's what we need to do. Here's evidence that God is on the move. And the people said, let us rebuild. They rose to the challenge because they saw the handiwork of God. Vision matters. Vision matters. If you're a leader, you need to have a vision of where God is leading you. Whether you're a small group leader, you're a parent in your home, on the job, leading in any capacity, it's not enough to simply do a do things the right way. You need to be able to know how to do the right things. Where is it God wants us to go? What is it that he wants us to do? A leader without vision isn't a leader at all. He's just a member of a committee. We need to have a word from God for my own life. I've written out a vision statement for my life that I go back and read once in a while to remind myself of what I believe that God has called me to do. And that's caused me to make some choices and say no to some things and yes to some others so that I'll stay on the track that God has for me. Every one of us needs to have a vision for 
for our life and a vision for the ministry that we're leading. You say, I'm not leading a ministry. Well, you can if God will give you a vision. And if you wait on him, he'll give you a vision on what you can do to reach the city. While we are a corporate body, God's got a calling on every believer's life. And the frustration happens when Christians sit around and say, I don't know what he wants me to do. I don't know where he wants me to go. I can't tell you that. But he can give you a heavenly vision. There was a day that the apostle Paul was walking on the road to Damascus and he was smitten down and blinded. And when he rehearses that at the end of the book of Acts, he tells what God showed him, that he would speak to kings, he would travel the world, lives would come to Christ. And he says this, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. What carried Paul through the shipwreck, through the stonings, through the snake bites, through the battles, through the attacks, because he had a vision of heaven and what God had called him to do. And I'm telling you that you won't make it through the days that are ahead if you don't have a vision for your life and what God has called you to do. Amen. Preach, brother. I'm trying to. You need a vision from heaven. The Bible says in the Old Testament, in the book of um, Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. Another place say where there is no revelation from God. What is a vision? It's a revelation from God. I'm not telling you you need to see angels dancing on the clouds. You need to see God's revelation for your life. And without that, the people perish. What does that mean? They cast off restraint. They're casting off restraint. They're going to perish. They're going to die. Some people in the church today have no idea where God's called them, where he wants them to go, what he wants them to do because they've not seen it from heaven. And so there are two things I want to challenge you with in the close here. You need a vision from God that directs your life in the days that are ahead, and you need to identify with a body of believers whose vision you share. Where are we going as Berean Church? Our vision hasn't changed. God's called us to extend hope and wholeness. Can you think of a time that the world needs a, uh, has needed a stronger message of hope and wholeness than today. Where? To broken humanity. That means we believe that people are broken, that this world is fallen, and we're going to look for opportunities to extend hope and wholeness. And I invite you in on the journey because it's us that are going to do the work. But you need to buy into that. You need to see that. You need to be a part of that. You need to own that vision. It needs to be yours. How can we extend hope and wholeness to a broken world? But then you need a vision for your life. Why are you here taking up space? I'll wrap it up this way. What happened here to the time? Here's a question that every church needs to ask. Why did God need another church in this town? If we can't answer why God put Brian at 5299 East University, if God didn't have a reason for that, a specific purpose in that, we need to close the doors because it's not enough to just sit in a space. Are you hearing me this morning? I believe that, I teach that, I tell pastors that when I teach on leadership, we talk about how essential it is to know why God put you in that community. Why did he put us on the east side, not the west side? Why did he put us in Pleasant Hill and not in somewhere else? Why? There's a reason for that, let's find it. But he didn't put you here I'd come off the platform, but I have to stay six feet away. <laughs> Why did he put you here? He didn't put you here to warm a chair or to fill space. We are the army of God. We are kings and priests. We're a royal priesthood. What is your calling? What is your purpose? Well, how do I get that? You develop a relationship with him that he'll speak to you. Well, Pastor, I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do. Listen, go into your closet and stay there till you get a heavenly vision of why he's crafted you the way he has, why he's given you the giftings he's given you, and what purpose has he called you to do. You need to own a heavenly vision. And when you have that, God can grant you favor. So my prayer this morning 
that I'm going to ask you to pray is God, give me a vision and give us favor. We can't do things the way we used to do, and I don't know when it'll go back to normal, but there are things you can do that the church corporately can no longer do. What is he calling you to do? Could this be a moment that God is moving away from, <laughs> from a corporate flock that simply follows in line to a time that he's going to raise up people to be apostolic, to be prophetic, to be pastoral, to be evangelistic, to be teachers? and begin to influence the people that are around you. What a day, I will tell you, my wife will tell you, I've prayed for that day all of my life, that a day would come that people would rise up in their calling and not depend on someone to tell them what to do or provide them a way, but would have a vision from God and would follow that vision and see that fulfilled in their communities. There's no time to give up when you know what he's called you to do. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed, please. No one looking around. I feel like this part of the message is for some individuals specifically, that you just feel lost, you feel stuck, you feel like you've been treading water, running up the down escalator. And you'd say, I need a vision from God. I need a vision from God. Hold your hand up. I need his vision for my life. Hold my hands going up all over the place. Here's what I'm telling you. He has it for you right now in Jesus' name. God, I'm asking for an outpouring of your spirit in this room right now. <sighs> an outpouring of your spirit in this room right now that will give revelation, that will bring creativity, that will bring a direction for life in the days that are ahead to fulfill your kingdom purposes. God, I release that now in this room that you will give not just favor in the community, but you'll give vision to the people of God. Everyone in the house, I want you to lift your hands and thank God that he's the God of revelation. He's the God of direction. He's the God of hope. He's the God that provides everything that we need.